Hello, it has been a while. Um, these videos are about um, the Old Testament. It's basically, um, I mean, like like the name says, on the Old Testament made easy. Um, this is actually a class that I wrote for um, for our church. Um, I use a few books. Um, obviously, the Bible. Um, the second one is a book called Encountering um, the Old Testament. It is by Bill Arnold and Brian Baer. Um, it was um, copyrighted by Baker Books. Um, and I want to say it was sometime around 2000. Oh, it was uh, 99. Copyrighted in 99. Um, so there's that. Actually, they have a series of um, they have a series called Encountering Biblical Studies, and the, it's really good. Uh, this is another uh, book in that series. It's called Readings from the Ancient Near East. Um, it's by the same two. Uh, it's very neat. It, it has a breakdown of, of, of ancient um, ancient texts uh, that correlate with different um, biblical stories. Uh, for instance, creation and the flood. Um, you know. Uh, Ancestral Customs, Epic Literature, that kind of stuff. It's just a very, very neat book. Okay, so in, in this lesson, lesson we're going to talk about um, just an, a brief introduction to the Old Testament. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so first off, uh, what Bible means is simply book. I know there's a, if you go to a bookstore, you'll see a lot of different things that say book on it, but all the, all, I'm sorry, Bible on it. But all that Bible really means is, um, is book. Um, so then the canon of the Bible, um, canon comes, basically means measuring stick. Um, so when we talk about the canon of scripture or the canon of the Bible, those are the books that belong, um, the books that were, were seen to be, um, inspired. Um, so, uh, just in case there are, there are some who, who are a little vague on this, the Old Testament is basically all the books um, that were written um, before Christ, and the New Testament is all those books that have to do with Christ coming and after Christ. Um, so there were a few different tests for um, for the canon of Scripture. The first was who was it written by? It had to be either written by a prophet or a prophetically gifted person. Um, a lot of people ask, well, what about Moses? What about you know um, th those others? And um, for that, um, it's important to note that the Jews um, counted the writings of Moses and those others as uh, as prophetic. Um, Moses was considered one of the uh, one of the first prophets. So even though he's not necessarily Isaiah or Jeremiah, who we see as you know traditional prophets, um, he was still counted as a prophet. The second it was the audience. It had to be written to all generations. Um, the third uh, was the teaching. Did it measure up to previous revelation? Um, obviously, if if there was a let's just say hypocrisy in the teachings, um, you know, um, it wouldn't have been realized as. as Script, scripture, um, and so officially, the books of the old of the Old Testament were decided at, at what's called the Council of Yamnia, um, around 180. Um, but it's important to note that the confirmed confirmed books were already recognized uh, for generations before, um, and so we use the same books now um, in the Christian Church as as the Jews um, did. Um, not mentioning obviously the um, the books written in between um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, the pseudepigrapha and all those different ones. But anyways, um, so uh, the books of the law, or also called the Pentateuch, um, uh, it basically is Genesis through Deuteronomy. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now Genesis takes um, really a good chunk of time. It, 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 it starts at the beginning of, of time and it goes all the way to about about 1700 BC. Um, and so it discusses the origins of man and it discusses the origins of Israel. Um, and then Exodus 
picks up pretty much right after that, although it, there at the beginning it skips over a couple hundred years very rapidly. Um, so it goes from about 1700 to somewhere either 1400 or 1200 BC, depending on how you date the Exodus. Um, Leviticus then is, is at that time mark, or either 1400 or 1200, so, um, and I'm not giving exact dates um, for obvious reasons, it just seems a little bit, um, I don't know, persnickety to insist on specific dates about this when it's a little bit, you know, I mean, scholars aren't even set on when, when the Exodus was, so how much more fruitless would it be to <laughs> give an exact date? It, all you really need to know for an introductory kind of idea is that it was around either 1400 or 1200 BC. Um, now, obviously, um, Exodus is, is, is about God's salvation of the helpless. You have the nation of Israel who um, wasn't that large, and, and they couldn't help themselves, and so God saved them from that. Leviticus picks up there. They go to the desert um, there at the end of Exodus, and Leviticus picks up right there. Um, it's best to look at, look at these five books as just one long story. Um, it's best not to see them as, as their own thing. Um, so Leviticus is basically a call to pursue relationship with this God. Um, Numbers picks up right after that and covers the 40 years in the wilderness. Um, and the effects of, of not following that relationship with God. Um, and then Deuteronomy is for the next generation after that. That's basically the renewal of the law um, that, um, that God is now reaffirming, reaffirming uh, his, his covenant with this new generation. As I said, the Gen Genesis through Deuteronomy is really one unit. Um, we like to see them as different books, but really it is one unit. Um, you see key themes, you know, kind of connecting them all together. Um, it's also called the Pentateuch or the Torah, uh, meaning law or instruction. Um, it seems that though that at least most of it was written by Moses outside of Canaan. Um, so somewhere between in the 40 years or after the 40 years seems most likely, um, you know, just somewhere in there. And, and we also see a series of events which threaten the promise. You know, um, God gives this promise. You know, and he keeps he calls Abraham, and you know he he makes this promise, and he keeps reaffirming it to all these generations. And what we see is events which constantly threaten the promise. Is God big enough to handle it? Um, will he remember his promise? Will he remember his people? Um, you know, who 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 is in charge of all this? Um, Another thing that we see in, in the books of the law is that God sought fellowship. He, he wanted a connection with these people. Um, I mean, that's really, I mean, enough said, you know, why beat a dead horse? Um, another thing to note is that the genealogies are not complete. I know a lot of times people think, well, if the genealogies are not complete, that means that it's not accurate. Well, not really. Um, all that that means is that the writer wanted to you know, specifically give reference to those genealogies. Um, Hebrews is, I mean, not Hebrews, Hebrew is, is a lot different than English, and there's just a lot of different subtleties in Hebrew that really don't translate over to English. Um, and so a lot of times, um, a lot of times we're just not really sure about the variety, or I guess you could say diversity of a word used. Um, so it's important not to make big deals out of little deals. Um, can we date the age of the earth by the Old Testament? No, we cannot, because it's, first off, when it was written, it was not written for that purpose. Um, it was written for a purpose, and <laughs> that's not it. Um, and so um, the genealogies are not complete in, in summation. But once again, that, that's kind of an argument for, for a lot of more intelligent scholars than me. <laughs> um, it also shows Israel's responsibility. Um, that God called them to be a witness to these nations, that God, that God called them and saved them, and because of that, there was a certain amount of responsibility that they carried. Um, and also, uh, we'll be looking at the law as well. It's important that you see the law in light of Christ. Okay, um, Don't try to just um, blindly you know, push the Old Testament. i tell you what a lot of times Christians do um, is we tend to go to extremes. Um, about stuff. Either a lot of Christians go to the extreme of saying, okay, we are saved by grace, and so I don't have to follow anything in the Bible, just, you know, as long as I'm right with God, you know, we have this understanding. But then there's this other extreme where we try to make people Christians 
not, not people, but we try to make Christians Jewish. And that they have to follow the Old Testament, they have to get circumcised, they have to do all these things. And it's important to note that Paul did warn against that. Now, we'll talk more about that um, throughout the course of, of, the, of the lessons to come. But just it's important to note that the law is seen in light of Christ. Okay. <clears throat> so then that takes us to what's called the books of history. Uh, the first five books are called the books of the law. These next books are called the books of history. Um, the first off the book of Joshua, which picks up immediately after Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy is more giving the law for the next generation as they prepare to go into the land. Um, Joshua is more like, okay, now what? You know, so now they actually go into the land. Um, we this, I mean, with it ending right after Deuteronomy, it's obviously somewhere around 1400 or 1200 when the events happen. Um, and then right after Joshua, the events of Judges happen, but it seems as though Judges was written after a time had, had uh, ended, after Joshua, so after, um, after a certain amount of time. Um, so it's dated somewhere between like 14 or 1200 to about 1050 or so. Um, once again, it kind of depends how you date a few things, and that's not really important for a brief introduction. Um, so then Ruth, ha the book of Ruth happens sometime during the Judges. Um, it, it gives specific reference to that, um, so it's just somewhere in there. Um, and then First and Second Samuel pick up pretty much right at the end of, uh, of the events of Judges, um, so somewhere around 1100 to about 971. Um, and then obviously Second Samuel ends with King da with the end of King David's reign. Um, so then First and Second Kings pick up going from King Solomon all the way down to the end of uh, Judah. And you can see there I have A and B. Um, this is um, during the time of Assyria and Babylon as world powers. Um, Kings was probably written during the time of the uh, Babylonian exile, which we'll talk about that later, so don't don't worry about that yet. Um, so then uh, First and Second Chronicles uh, picks up about a little bit after uh, First Samuel does. Uh, it kind of just very briefly mentions King Saul. Um, mostly starts with King David um, and then follows his line down. Um, and so it covers the, span, the span, span of time from about 1010 to about 539. Um, obviously that takes us down into probably the Persian um, Persian dominance. So Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Uh, covers a very wide span of time. Um, so then the last three books of history, um, Ezra and Nehemiah, which were seen as, as, as connected books, um, in the in the Jewish custom, um, and it covers from about 539 to about 410 the two books, um, but Ezra itself covers 539 to about 450 or so. Um, this is down in the time of Persia. Nehemiah covers about 445 to about 410. Once again, also in the time of Persia. Esther is about 43 to 474. It happens there. Um, there's this there's this break in Ezra which we'll talk about when we get there, and it happens right about there. Um, so those are the rough approximate dates. Um, and I don't think that it's that important to get exact dates on this kind of stuff, as long as you understand the general flow, especially for an introduction. Now, if this was an advanced like graduate course or something like that, I can imagine you know really delving through stuff, but I don't really see that as necessary for this. Um, so the books of history cover from the 1400s to about somewhere in the 400s or so. That's that's a good span of time. Um, we also see God speaking in many ways. Um, prophets, disasters, all these different things. Um, you know, and, and you see just a variety of, of ways. Um, so in a lot of the books of history, God won't specifically say this was wrong. He'll more of show a diagram of, of you know, this and this. And you'll see a lot of extremes in the Bible. Um, it really is a book that has a lot of extremes in it. Um, Job, for instance, he's not just a righteous person. He's an extremely righteous person. Um, and then not just, at the end of the book, not just as, a, as another righteous person or an angel even um, come and talk to him. God himself talks to him. See, it's about extremes. Not to say that they're not true, just to say that, that the Bible does utilize extremes to teach messages and points. Um, for instance, in Judges it says, and nobody, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Every single one of them. Um, we also see um, the Israelites' historical emphasis, um, and that's something that's unique to the Israelites. Um, a lot of 
um, a lot of different things. <laughs> when we compare it to other other stuff, I mean, they either had myths or they had you know history which excluded a lot of events or whatnot. But for the Israelites, um, they had this unique historical emphasis where the history was recorded for a reason. It was a revelation, um, if you will. Um, it was recorded for theology. So you have theology mixed in with their history, and as a result, um, we don't have a very objective historical account. Okay, And so because of that, um, you have Christians obviously going to the extreme of, oh, we have to support the Bible, and that means that it's completely uh, historically accurate, which I'm not saying it isn't. Um, and then you have other people going to the other extreme who don't believe in the Bible and say, you know, um, well, uh, these these historical events are skewed. You know, once again, it's not really about history. It only it uses history for a purpose. But once again, I'm not saying that the Bible is not true. I'm just saying, you know, we we need to look at it with fresh eyes. And I'll explain what I mean uh, later on uh, in the future. Um, so all the Old Testament is given by prophets is it, is kind of the view um, from the Jews there. Um, we, we also see a lot of irony. We see people continue, continuing to sin even though it seems like they wouldn't. And as a result, a lot of Christians kind of don't see how it applies to their lives, um, even though we oftentimes do the exact same thing that the uh, Israelites did. So, um, enough of that. That takes us to wisdom and poetry. Um, now, wisdom and poetry is really scattered all throughout the books. Um, but there are certain books that are called um, the the books of the books of poetry. I mean, sorry, the books of wisdom, and this is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Psalms, uh, Song of Solomon. Um, <clears throat> so Job it happens sometime probably between the first eleven chapters of Genesis, um, just because of of the way that uh, things are happening and, and who is involved in all these different things, places, and that kind of stuff. Um, now, uh, in a book called um, uh, Grasping God's Word, written by Duvall and Hayes, uh, which was published by Zondervan, and that was somewhere in 2000, oh, I want to say six or so, maybe five, let me check. Um, this copy that I have is from 2005. Um, they brought up something very interesting that I included in this, and that was, you know, Proverbs gives us the approach to life, okay? But then... In these other um, wisdom books, we have the exceptions. Um, you know, Proverbs, hey, this is how you should live your life. But then the exception one, what about those who, those, the righteous who's, who have to suffer? Exception number two, what about, um, what about can, can we reach our purpose simply by reason, by logic, by wisdom? Can that help us to achieve purpose in life? And Ecclesiastes says no. Um, and then Song of Solomon, well, what about irrational love? <laughs> So, um, obviously, Song of Solomon has strongly debated. Um, I'll give you what I think is a fair look at it um, and let you go from it for there. Um, but uh, definitely, definitely encouraging marital love. Um, so, Job was written sometime between the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Psalms was written at least finalized during the exile. Uh, we know that because one of the Psalms, I think it's 138, somewhere around there, um, mentions... <clears throat> that um, they're in Babylon and they're, these people are wanting them to sing a song and they're like, you know, how I wish that their kids would have been dashed against the rocks. You know, and so you really just see this this, this theme of exile uh, in that song. Um, so at least it was finished sometime during the exile or afterwards. Um, Proverbs was written during the monarchy. This was, when I say monarchy, I mean when Israel was still one nation. Um, for those of you who don't know, Israel split into two nations. Um, but that's, we'll get to that when we start looking at the uh, chronology of the events. Um, and it basically is, this is the approach to life. Um, we'll talk about this more, uh, more later when, when we actually talk about Proverbs, but... Um, Ecclesiastes was probably written during the monarchy as well. Probably both of those were written by King Solomon, in fact, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Um, despite common uh, ideas, Psalms was actually not completely written by King David. There was a lot of it that was not. Um, Song of Solomon was probably written by Solomon or, or someone who Solomon commissioned. Um, so we can date it to about that same time as well. Uh, poetry is a style, really, if you look at it, and wisdom is more of content. So that's a good way to define the two. Now, these aren't obviously very, let's just say, always accurate. 
but um, it's just a good starting point to see poetry as a style of writing and wisdom as the content of what's in there. So because of that, I've kind of included them as two, different, two very similar things because they oftentimes mesh, especially in the po in the prophets. And um, all the poetry has a lot of wisdom. All the wisdom has a lot of poetry. So um, they they have structure. Uh, meter, you know, they have, if you know much about poetry from high school or anything like that, they do definitely have that. Maybe not necessarily in the translation over, although sometimes that's maintained, um, but very much so in the original. Um, so just a few things to look at. One thing, um, one form of structure that they have is what's called parallelism. Um, now, I'm going to read from the New American Standard uh, Bible, uh, the update, updated edition published by Zondervan. In, uh, this one is from 95, so the Lachman Foundation of Zondervan. Zondervan. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, this one was, was copyrighted in 2002 as the Thin Line. Um, okay, so um, uh, parallelism, and that's this. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. So you have two basically same ideas um, repeated just in a different way. And that's called parallelism, um, but the ideas are parallel. Um, then we have uh, something called chiasm. Now chiasm is actually scattered all throughout the Bible, um, and it's very important to note. Uh, Psalm 8, the entire thing is chiastic, and what that means is that it basically has, it, it comes from the Greek Greek uh, letter chi, which looks like Rx, looks like this, and so what it'll do, here, let's just say that, is it'll come down and it'll come back. So it'll start on this point and end on this point. And whatever's in the middle is usually the most important aspect that the writer wants to emphasize. So in Psalm 8, it starts at, O Lord, o, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. But then it ends, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So then the next tier, B, A, B, C, C, B, A, something like that. So um, you'll have variations of this, but I think I hope you get the point. Um, so then the B is, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and, um, and the revengeful cease. Um, and then uh, B in, in verse 6, you make him to rule over works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, and it goes on like that. So then what is the middle of this chiastic structure? What's the C? A, B, C, B, A? Um, remember, it starts and ends on the same. That's the A. And then the C, or whatever deep it goes in is going to be the main point. Uh, so what's the main point of, of uh, Psalm 8? What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. Um, so you, I, I hope you see what chiastic structure is. If you don't, just keep watching. Um, I'll give you many examples throughout scripture of chiastic structure. Um, so then another another thing um, used um, throughout the Bible in structure is is uh, what's called acrostics. And basically, without oversimplifying this, um, it's basically that each line or each section, each section starts with a letter of the alphabet. So for us, it would be like, okay, um, you know, our alphabet, obviously, A, B, C. So line one would be about that time, and then B would be because of this, and then C would be... Um, cause delays or whatever. Um, but you, I'm sure you get the idea. And if you turn to one, Psalm 119, you'll actually see this. Um, in fact, it even breaks it down for you. It says Aleph, Beth, Gamil, um, Daleth, He. You see the different, and what do those mean? Those are the different sections that are broken up by the alphabet. So Aleph, how blessed are those uh, whose way is blameless. So it starts um, with the Aleph. And then how can a young man keep his way pure? That starts with the Beth. Um, and so um, it works its way like that. Um, and th these are, this is done by sections, but it can also be done by lines. Um, a man came by because he was tall. Um, you know, uh, I, mean, I hope you see what I'm saying. I can't think of anything on the spot right now, but I hope you see what I'm saying. And I'll try to point that out uh, as it comes. Yeah, more, uh, mostly Psalm 119 is the biggest example of that. Um, so then that takes us to what's called the major prophets. Um, Isaiah was in about 740 to 700. This is during the time of Assyria. Uh, we'll get into the dating of this uh, later, so it's not that important for you to memorize right now. Um, Jeremiah um, was about 627 to about 580 during the time of Babylon. Once again, I'll uh, 
talk about the books in chronological order. I'm not going to talk about them as they appear in your in your Christian Bible. I'm going to talk about them in chronological order. Hopefully that will help you see the overriding themes and what's actually happening. Um, Lamentations was traditionally written by Jeremiah. Um, that's obviously not proven since he doesn't have his name anywhere in there. Um, but um, histor traditionally that's what people have, have attributed it to, who they have attributed it to. Ezekiel um, was about 590 to 570. This is during Babylon. Um, and Daniel was from about 605 to about 530. So this, uh, he really started in, in the time of Babylon, but then went, went through to the time of Persia. Um, and so the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonas, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Um, Hosea was 760 to 730, um, the time of the Assyrians. Joel was about 500, the time of the Persians. Amos was 760, time of the Assyrians. Obadiah, 500, Persia. Jonah, 770, Assyria. Micah, 730 to about 690, Assyria. Um, Nahum, 650, Assyria was still in control, but Babylon was gaining gaining, th gaining steam. They really started to rebel. I think it was in 650 when Babylon starts to rebel against Assyria. We'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, they really didn't rise to power until about 620 or so. Uh, not 620 exactly, I mean the 620s. Uh, Habakkuk was about 630. Babylon was, was really starting to gain, gain steam around that time. Um, but Assyria was still technically the, the power. Uh, Zephaniah uh, 627, Babylon was gaining steam once again, but Assyria was still technically in control. Um, Haggai is about 520, time of the Persians. Zechariah 520 to 518, about time of the Persians. Um, Haggai and Zechariah are actually very closely related and are mentioned in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so then Malachi uh, is about 433. Uh, and this is during the time of Persia. So just a few things about the prophets. I already mentioned how there there are what's called early prophets and then classic prophets. Now, classic prophets are the ones you, you know of, Elijah, Elisha, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, those ones. But early prophets are those who we don't really call prophets nowadays, um, especially in, in, in Christian churches, uh, Protestant and whatnot. But they were still um, seen by the Jews um, as prophets. Um, so a prophet was responsible for delivering the message, not the reception of the message. Um, and we also see conditions of prophets in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, and 18, 21 through 22. Um, one was that the prophecy had to have come true, um, and second off, the prophecy couldn't go against uh, the previous prophecy. So, um, so their job was to deliver God's message in form of His wrath, warn of His ju uh, of His of His judgment, uh, call the people to repent, proclaim the salvation. That was their job. Um, so uh, the things that they said were what's called divine insight, and we'll look at you know I don't really understand how to how to I don't really get the prophets. Don't worry about it. We'll get to it then. Um, just keep hanging in there. Um, there is divine insight, though. They are called by God. No prophet calls themselves. Um, that no prophet calls themselves. There is someone called by God, regardless of how they feel about it. Um, like Jeremiah, for instance, had a hard time with this, uh, but he, you know, he was called by God, and the insight that he had was divine. It was from God, and it wasn't just him noting society or him noting problems or whatever. Um, it also, it's important to see the prophets as God's message to the hurt and the lost. Oftentimes when we're going through the prophets, we, we get wrapped up in, in, you know, oh, God was really angry there. He really showed them. But to see it like that is to really kind of miss God's heart. God doesn't enjoy killing people. It's not like he's, oh, hooray, I get to punish someone who is evil and wicked. No, that's not God's heart. Okay? He warns for a reason. He wants to restore people to himself. That's why he's gone through all the nonsense in the first place. He knew that man was going to fail, but he, with that knowledge, he gave a way out. Um, so, yeah, that's a discussion for another time, though. Um, so, prophets are not hysterical or babblers. This list was actually uh, adapted from the Encountering the Old Testament book that I referenced. Um, not, they were not hysterical or babblers. We like to think of you know <laughs> weird people. The, the, the prophets were, were, were real people, not weird people. Um, uh, they were not fortune tellers, um, especially how we think of fortune tellers today, you know, with their little glass balls where they conjure the th No, not like that. Um, for those of you in the Pentecostal churches, it, it works very similar to how, um, how that works nowadays. 
Um, they were not argumentative fanatics. You know, they weren't just going around waiting for somebody to come against them so that they could proclaim hell and damnation. And they also didn't proclaim hell and damnation when it suited them, but when it suited God. Um, so they were not sitting around waiting to yell like, oh yes, I finally get to prove my point. Uh, there were people who were devoted to God, and they used songs, speeches, and parables in all kinds of different ways to communicate um, his message to people. Um, prophets do not ma manipulate God uh, through magic or other uh, mystical term, mystical uh, ways. They, they simply sought after the Lord, and the Lord used them for a specific purpose. Prophets are God's mouthpiece. Okay, So, um, uh, Bible prophets address the whole nation. They address the heart, not the ritual. Um, a lot of times, in, in the other prophets from other nations at the time, they wouldn't just they wouldn't address the whole nation. They would address you know um, one or two things. But sometimes they would address the whole nation. Really, a lot of variety there. But in the biblical prophets, the whole nation is really in view. They want people to be in um, relationship with God. Um, they address the heart, whereas other prophets um, that were not the biblical prophets tended to um, address more of the ritual. You you have forsaken a non as ritual, you have forsaken, you know, this so and so's ritual, um, and so with we see the prophets, it's really the heart. The heart is the issue. Um, also, um, they address the moral obligations. Um, I think that one kind of speaks for itself. Um, just because you're saved does not give you clairvoyance to, um, or not clairvoyance, but. It doesn't give you the right to just ignore problems in your midst. You know, Paul talks about this, purge the evil from your midst. Christians, um, especially in the churches, should not be condoning or, or, or approving of sexual immorality, or not sexual immorality, but I mean it, um, sin. Sexual immorality is a sin, but you know. Anyways, um, they also address the consequences of what, uh, of what, what this would lead to. Secular prophets uh, use a lot of signs, um, like if an, a bird was flying at a certain time of year, for instance, or something like that. You know, um, they would use animals uh, with their intestines and stuff like that, um, and and it really wasn't concerned so much about morality so much as as doing these right rituals and all that stuff. Um, so what we see is Jesus, in a way, was a prophet. Um, you know, he did these things. You know, he 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 foretold the future. He he tell he told truth. You know, he he um he was concerned for God. He was devoted. He addressed not just the whole nation, but the whole world. He was concerned with people heart people's hearts with their with their morality. He was concerned for people. So as we look at the symbols of prophets, we see that Jesus really does mesh in there as a prophet. Um, however, not all prophets were recorded. Okay. Um, for instance, in Second Kings, it mentions actually First Kings as well. It mentions Elijah and Elisha. I mean, these prophets don't have their own books, nor are, are all their prof prophecies recorded. But the ones that God wanted recorded are recorded. Um, also, they were um, they oftentimes did not record it themselves. They had scribes or disciples that would either uh, write it for them or copy it for them. Um, all, all that really means when we say major and minor prophets is is major usually served and wrote longer. They served longer periods of time and they wrote longer books. This obviously is just a generalization as there are a lot of minor prophets who are as long as major prophets. For instance, I think it's Habakkuk, uh, I think, has 12 chapters and Daniel has 12 chapters. So, um, but anyways, um, so some themes throughout the prophets are the, are the covenant between God and Israel, excuse me, the day of the Lord and the Messiah or the anointed one. Um, so just uh, some, some, some themes there. And by the way, Messiah uh, is another word, uh, is the Hebrew word, Christ is a Greek word, um, and all it means is anointed one. So um, so the time of the prophets, they were really prophesying from about 770 to about 433, but remember, Elijah and Elisha were recording, I'm sorry, prophesying before that. So when I say the time of the prophets, I mean the time of the written prophets. Um, Okay, so just a few last things. I already mentioned this. I'm going chronologically through the Old Testament, not um, topical, not uh, in order of appearance, none of that. Um, the, also, there are different types of literature scattered throughout. For instance, the prophets are historical in a way, but they also contain poetry and wisdom. You know, but they also contain uh, prophecy. So you know, there's something just something to note there. Um, uh, the 
th there are no neat sections as we like to think. Um, Deuteronomy, I think, has you know a song of Moses, uh, so you have poetry and it has wisdom in it and it has prophecy in there, um, but yet it's technically part of the books of the law. Um, uh, so we see Israel used to judge other nations, um, um, but then also later we see God judging Israel um, for their lack of faithfulness. Um, for instance, uh, the, the people would be worshiping Baal, and God had to judge that because it's, you know goes against His character to not um, to not judge sin. And obviously, God is a holy God; He hates sin. He doesn't hate the sinner. He loves the sinner, but he he detests sin. He hates sin. So that's just important to note there. Um, if you have any questions, leave it in the comment box below. Um, this is the, we will continue um, with next lesson with the introduction to the Bible. Um, so I hope this was I hope this was you know um, beneficial for you and that you, you learned something. Um, have a great uh, great week. Bye.